Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. This is Lessons in Leadership. That is Mary Gamba, who is our executive producer and my co-anchor. Mary, we've got a great series we're going to introduce today. What is it and why does it matter so much? Yeah, no, thank you so much. And it's all tied to the Kessler Foundation. It's called Research, Science, Innovation, and Leadership. So it's all things having to do with the connection between those items, which is so important. And we kick off, um, we'll talk about our other sponsors a little bit later, but we kick off the show with Michelle Pignatella, who is, in fact, Vice President and Chief Development Officer at Kessler Foundation. Michelle, how are you doing today? I'm pretty good. How are you, Steve? We are doing great. By the way, great. why the series, number one? And number two, let us, let's set up this interview that we're about to do with Dr. Helen Genova, talking about her research. There are going to be a range of researchers and scientists with Kessler Foundation that will be featured in this series. Boy, is there a connection between research, science, and innovation and leadership. Talk yes. about it, Michelle. There certainly is. I mean, research is all about learning uh, new information, figuring out what we know, and then more importantly, figuring out what we don't know. And the purpose of the research we do at Kessler Foundation is to improve the lives of people who live with disabilities. Could be spinal cord injury, brain injury, uh, stroke, autism, multiple sclerosis. And our research are looking, our researchers are looking for ways to help them improve their function, improve quality of life, improve outcomes like employment. And um, as the chief fundraiser for the organization, I'm responsible for, you know, translate helping them translate, you know, that science that they're doing to inspire our donors. And what we say, what we say, and what is absolutely true is that our donors are jump starting innovation. They are the leaders. They're helping us lead in changing the lives of people with disabilities. By the way, do you mind, Michelle, if we put up the website of Kessler Foundation, just in case <laughs> Not people at all. Are, are moved Not at and all. inspired, if they're I moved and inspired and they want to contribute, they can do it right there on the site, right, Michelle? Absolutely. I mean, we rely on, on the contributions of, of leaders, our donors, to carry out this research. It wouldn't be possible without them. You know, um, when you're about, you're about to see this interview with Dr. Helen Genova, who's doing really important research. Um, and I will tell you, as someone who's been connected, Mary and I have been connected to Kessler Foundation and a good friend, Roger DeRose, who leads the organization, a great team of people. We have learned so much. We've been inspired. Um, we've been moved. And frankly, we've made a decision to help people know more about Kessler Foundation. And it is all about leadership, not just mm -hmm. research and science, and innovation, but it is leading the way. So I wanna thank you so much. And by the way, Michelle's gonna be joining us for several interviews as we set up these conversations, but you're right, you're about to see right now, Dr. Helen Genova. And thank you so much, Michelle. You're welcome, have a great day. Mary, you got it. Like, thanks for the opportunity. It. There's a little delay, right? It's the way it is. All Check good. this out. We're now joined uh, by our good friend, Dr. Helen Genova, Assistant Director, Center for Neuropsychology, neuroscience research at Kessler Foundation as part of this great series looking at research, science, innovation, and leadership. Helen, good to have you with us. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, Helen, I know your research because we've worked together for a long time uh, in my doing some coaching and training at Kessler Foundation, and I've been fascinated by your work, you and your colleagues. Describe exactly what your area of research is. Sure. So we study clinical populations and how they understand the thoughts, feelings, beliefs of others and how they socially function in society. Give us a concrete example of that. Absolutely. So one of the um, areas of research that I'm focusing on now is um, on transition age youth uh, on the autism spectrum and trying to help them successfully navigate into adulthood. So for example, helping them obtain employment, maintain employment, those are some of the things that I'm focusing on right now. Um, before Mary jumps in, I'm curious about this. Since this series attempts to, and you just heard from Michelle Pignatello, um, and you also check out our previous interview with Roger DeRose, who actually introduced this series on research, science, innovation, and leadership. Do you see yourself, I mean, you're clearly a researcher. You're a scientist. Uh, you innovate. Do you see yourself as a leader? And if so, how? You know, it's it's something that I think comes over time. And and yes, I think that I finally feel like I've started to grow in that position. 
um, you know, as as someone who has always sort of suffered from imposter syndrome as a scientist. <laughs> well, hold on. Helen, is that a scientific term? <laughs> I don't think so. I think it's I think it's present in a number of, of fields. I'm but, in that um, club too. I'm okay. in the imposter club, but go ahead. Absolutely, yeah. No, it's and it's actually something that a lot of overachievers um, feel. And just feeling like, am, am I supposed to be doing this? Are you guys all sure that that this is that you've given me something to lead? Are you sure you want to do this? So it's something that I've had to uh, grow into this position. But I, I feel more comfortable now. And I think the key to that has been when you're a young scientist, you're sort of overwhelmed by the number of questions you can ask. You can you can look into any question, every population, every type of problem. But I think that as a leader, I've had to start to realize what are the important questions to ask. And that has really made all the difference um, in my career is to say, you can ask any question, but which questions are going to lead to the most significant direct clinical benefit to the population that we study? It's so interesting. As Mary jumps in, one of the chapters in Lessons in Leadership, our book that the uh, you'll see the graphic of it come up right away. It's simply, I think the title of the chapter area is great leaders ask probing questions and they're curious and so how we ask questions what questions we ask why we ask those questions matters or not matters a lot not just the answers go ahead mary yeah and part of asking questions and part of what you're doing at kessler foundation in terms of research being able to do that is building relationships right going out and raising money raising the dollars to do the great work that you do talk about that a little bit talk about why it is so important to do the fundraising so you can do the research and continue to help uh you know the people that you serve absolutely so you know when we want to do a study you have to think about all of the expenses that go along with that study so we want to make sure that whoever is involved in our studies, um, in terms of, let's say, teenagers with autism, for example, that they're being properly compensated for their time, that they're not doing it for free. We want to make sure that they have that, that compensation. And then also we need to make sure that our staff is properly compensated, that we have the technology that we need to, to answer the, the important questions that we have. And so as a scientist, it's not just doing the experiments, but it's constantly going back into the community whether that is federal funders like the NIH, or whether it's private donors um, or state grants, et cetera, and to be able to say to them, listen, this is what we plan to do with the funding you'll give us, and to, to make them confident that the money that they invest in us, they'll see a return on their investment, which is a, a clinical benefit to the populations that they care about as well. Sure. Yeah, and for people, Mary, stay with it. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say. Oh, I'm sorry, there's a little bit of background noise there. But for How people dare that... there be background noise? <laughs> there's been no technological glitches today <laughs> at all. Um, <laughs> but anyhow, so for those people that are watching right now, obviously there's so many people that want to help. Is there a way, whether it's financially or with um, you know donations, with contributing their time, what ways can people help? So people can, can go to the Kessler Foundation website and there's a button right there. Yes, yes. Us. And the button, just say, you know, make a donation, for example, they can contact us as scientists and say, I want to know more about your research so that they can investigate, you know, are there specific projects that they would like to mm -hmm. donate to? So if somebody really, really cares about the field of autism, for example, they can contact me, hgenova at kesslerfoundation.org and, and reach out to me and say, hey, I'd love to hear more about your work and I potentially invest it, 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 want to be an investor in it. Um, that would be absolutely wonderful. We would we would love that. So, Helen, I want to follow up on something. And the uh, Kessler Foundation website will be up throughout this entire segment, so you can follow up as as uh, Dr. Genova just said. Because we've worked together for a long time, and I had this same conver a similar conversation with uh, Dr. Nancy Chevrolati, who is your colleague, and um, we've worked together, and I've and I've done a lot of coaching to disclose at Kessler Foundation. Because I've seen you grow. Um, as a leader, not as a scientist, because my doctorate clearly is in a non-scientific field, the art form of communication, which is not a science. That being said, I've seen you grow in confidence. I've seen you grow in your executive presence. I've seen you grow in the ability to connect with people and communicate a range of complex, scientific, clinical sometimes, language and concepts to all kinds of audiences. You didn't start that way. 
What's that journey been like for you? You know, it, it's something where you have to use multiple skills at one time. And so, for example, if I'm in front of one audience, let's say it's a scientific audience, I know that I can use scientific jargon. It's what's expected. If I didn't use it, they'd wonder why. Um, however, as I've grown um, in, this, in this position at the Kessler Foundation, more and more I've had to speak to audiences in which scientific jargon is not going to be helpful. And I think one of the things that I learned from you, which was so helpful, was how do I get my message across? And how do I make people understand in a way that's simple but effective and, and makes them understand the impact of our research? And so it has been a learning process. You have to sort of take the temperature of the room, um, watch people's faces. Are people understanding what you're saying? If not, okay, explain it again in a different way. Giving concrete examples about how our research has really, really benefited um, the, the community. So even if it's an example of, a, of, of someone that I've worked with personally and, and watched our research help them. So I think that um, that is how I've, I've sort of put in the time to develop those, those communication skills. But Mary, here, there's something beyond what Helen's saying right now. There's something uh, I wanna follow up on and I want you to be a part of this conversation as well, Mary. So I'm, I'm a student of trying to understand confidence how confidence develops, how and why we lose it, um, how you maintain it, how you deal, how, how can you be confident when you feel anxious and nervous, whatever. So here, here's what I'm getting at. We've worked with a lot of people in our leadership academies and communication academies that Mary is such a big part of, and Kessler Foundation is one of them, but here's the thing. I've often said, Mary, and I want you to jump in here and then come back to Dr. Genova, that just being really smart in an area, just being the smartest physician, the smartest researcher, the smartest accountant, the smartest lawyer, the smartest person, the person who knows the most about your field does not make you an effective leader slash communicator. Mary, it's been challenging to help really smart people transition to have to communicate and share with others who are wondering, hey, why aren't you as smart as I am? Yeah, in this exactly. Area. Go ahead. Yeah, and, and one of those things that we really talk about with people um, who are, as Steve said, in those positions is really talking about empathy and really trying to put yourself in the other person's shoes. Instead of going into a room and talking about a long diagnosis and a prognosis and what rehabilitation is going to have to take place, maybe just start by asking them how their day was. Go to the human side of things. Make that connection because oftentimes we find once you start getting into the jargon and these big words and big names, uh, people tune out and then it's hard to get them back. So how do you coach and train the people on your team and others how to be that caring, empathetic, talk to really talk to people as humans rather than talking over them? Yes, that's such a good question. Um, you know, I think one of the mistakes that we make um, sometimes in life is to feel like when you're coaching teams of people, you have to treat everyone the same, make sure that everyone is treated equally. But people come in with their own experiences, their own cultures, their own personalities, their own identities, and, and all of these things. And you have to, I think you have to sort of meet that person where they are right in that moment, in that year of their life. You know, if um, a person is having a bad day and maybe they've lost someone that's, that's dear to them, or if a woman has just had a really happy event, like a, a baby, you know, um, you have to make sure that you're taking all of that into consideration and, and treating each person as an individual. And so one thing that I've tried to do is I've tried to you know, make personal connections with each team member and to try to figure out what each person needs from me and then try to give it. So for example, if I have someone who is very timid and I get the sense not very confident, but I think that their voice is really valuable, I give them that feedback. You know, you have a voice and we want to hear it. And, and how can I help you find that voice and, and, and make yourself heard? And then you may have someone who maybe talks too much and takes a, a lot of time and you may need to give them different feedback. And so I think, you know, like I said, you can't treat everyone the same. It's just nearly impossible. And I don't think it's an effective leadership. Helen, before I let you go, the greatest satisfaction and reward you get 
from your research is? I think it is watching teens with autism respond to the research that we've been doing with them. You know, one of the wonderful things is we do it now virtually because of the pandemic. So a lot of our research is being done online. And so because of that, I can actually sit in on a Zoom call and watch one of my staff members train someone with autism how to do better on job interviews, for example. So the most wonderful thing is to sit there and be a fly on the wall and watch them really start to, the light bulb going off in their mind, like, oh, I can say that on a job interview, that's okay. And, and just to watch how excited they become learning these new skills. So I think that has really been the rewarding thing. Like I said, seeing the direct impact and benefit to the population that I care so much about. That is Dr. Helen Genova, part of the great team at Kessler Foundation, part of this series that we're doing, looking at research, science, innovation, and leadership um, through the support and the partnership with Kessler Foundation and our many, many other sponsors and supporters of Lessons in Leadership. Helen, thank you so much. Best to you and your family and the team and the family, if you will, at Kessler Foundation. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me. It was great. You got it. We'll be right back right after this. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Kessler Foundation, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ, and Commerce Magazine. Construction companies work at the heart of our communities. So do the operating engineers of Local 825, who build our roads and bridges and ensure the safe transmission of energy that keeps us on the move. Local 825 works with contractors as partners in quality, safety, and training. Our achievements stand as monuments to collaboration that will last for generations. This message has been brought to you by the members of Operating Engineers Local 825. Better building begins here. Welcome back to Lessons in Leadership. Steve and Mary here. Hey, Mary, so much going on with uh, the folks at Kessler Foundation. We'll continue that series. It is fascinating, isn't it? It is so fascinating and so inspiring. We talk about the stresses that we face. We talk about when things go wrong and there's a crisis. And but this is, I mean, when we when we have people, um, you know, like we're like Helen and Michelle talking just about all the research, science, innovation. They're truly saving lives and just the passion that they have. It makes just me feel really good. Hmm. And by the way, switching from such important matters to letting people know who sponsors our show, which is really important, or we wouldn't have a show. Mary, remind everyone who our sponsors are and then who our media partners are as well. Sure, definitely. I, I would love to thank Valley Bank, Prager Metis, the New Jersey Sharing Network, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825. Uh, Kessler Foundation, of course, Delta Dental of New Jersey, and Seton Hall University and the Bacino Leadership Institute. And I don't think I said the North Ward Center. Say the North Ward Center because I'm about to plug Seton Hall. Uh, Seton Hall, North Ward Center. So, uh, and you can go ahead and plug Seton Hall if you want. I was also going to thank our promotional partners. I just, before Mary does that, I just, I got to tell you something. It's not just that Seton Hall is a partner of ours, a sponsor of what we do, and I'm teaching there over at the Bucino Leadership. Institute in the spring semester of 2022 again. I just bought my season tickets to the Seton Hall 
basketball, the university basketball team, men's basketball team. It's going to be great over at Prudential, right, Mary? Yes. Can I say something you, right now? Go ahead. You know, you know this. I have never been to a basketball game in my life. I am going to put it on my bucket list this fall, or I don't even know when basketball happens. Is it now? I don't know. <laughs> Mary, I'm going to go. Happens, it happens right at late into uh, late in 2021 into 2022. You know what March Madness is, or do you I not? Do. No, I do. No, I'm aware of what it is. I've just never gone because the squeaking of the shoes, it's a sensory thing. That squeaky, I've heard squeaky. this. Yeah, exactly. So I'm going to go, though. Me. Mary, you're going to get past this. You are going to sit with me. We're yes. just about courtside. I couldn't Invite me. I'll come. One game. That's all. Just uh, the um, two of us. Mm-hmm. I'm all in. Right? Yes. Tell, tell your husband. You're going with me. I'll tell Jen, my wife. Yep. I'm going with you. She don't, I don't know why she doesn't come to the games. Our kids love the games. You will love it, Mary. Oh, no, I'm looking forward to it, definitely. And that's a good segue. I know that we wanted to talk about one of our other favorite sports teams, and I have been to many of these games. Where are you pulling these out of? <laughs> I got 18 hats here. <laughs> By the way, oh my this Yankee hat is not even, not even the official blue. I was going to say, that off. doesn't even look like a, that's a, that's some swag. You want to know not... why I have this? Seriously? Was it a giveaway? Because, I'm going to tell you something in all seriousness. Because the Yankees, and, and as we're doing this program in the fall of, uh, it's in September 2021, Yankees have been up and down. They win 13 games. They lose 10 games. So Mary and I have been obsessed with the idea of consistency. So this is a true story. By the way, Mary said that one day when we leave real broadcasting, she wants to do a show where just the two of us are sort of like Howard Stern and his partner Robin Quivers, except we'll be way more entertaining and yes. we will not be gross or anything like that. But I got to tell you something. This is pretty much what we want to do. And I'm going to tell you something, Mary. The reason I have this color Yankee hat is because when the Yankees were losing, I kept purchasing different Yankee hats in the hopes that they would... Scarlet, it's true, behind the camera, a Met fan. I kept changing hats in the hope... I have a gray one. I have a black one. I have a, the right blue one, the royal blue one. Yeah. All different kinds. I have a Derek Jeter one. I have an Aaron Judge one. Just to change the losing streak. Yeah, you know, I, I, I hate like to, that. I, no, I, I, well, I do, I do. We have the whole rally cap. You turn it, you know, inside out, backwards. We do the rally cap. Yeah, but then you got to turn it literally inside out. So, uh, you know, and I, oh, uh, my right. dad's a huge Yankees fan. You know, he, you know, he watches our show religiously, and the, the words that come out of his mouth while he's watching the Yankees games, I can't say here on a television. Your dad? But, oh yeah, he's yep. such a gentleman. Not when it comes to watching the Yankees. Yeah, them and the Jets, when he watches the Jets, the words that come before the Jets, it's never anything good. <laughs> okay, so let's let's do this. Uh, by the way, do the, the media partners, then I'm going to go back yeah, to the I'd Yankees to. not yeah, being consistent. The, our, our promotional pa partners are CIANJ in Commerce Magazine, NJBIA in New Jersey Business Magazine. And also, if you're in a podcast, check us out on Spotify, Audible, uh, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and when in doubt, go to our website, stand-deliver.com. I could not stress enough. You can go there. We have free articles on everything leadership and communication, all free resources, just to learn how to become a better, more effective leader and communicator. Okay, so here's the thing. Thank you, Mary, for that. And thank you all to our sponsors, our media colleagues as well. So here's my thing. As we're doing this program in the middle toward the end of September, I'm hoping the Yankees win and go all the way. Who knows when you see this? But here's my issue. One of the things about leadership, you may be asking, what the heck is after leadership? I'm a big fan of consistency. That doesn't mean you do the same thing every time. It means that the standard of excellence, listen, Mary, how much do I obsess? Garland, Elvin, how much do I obsess over the way I look, we look, sound, the whole bit? Oh, yeah. And what does that have to do with consistency, the Yankees, and leadership, Mary? Yeah, it has everything to do with it. We've talked uh, behind the scenes about the Yankees that they could be down for nothing, and they, you know, they shoot to the dugout, and the guys are laughing and yucking it up. It's do you take yourself seriously? Do you take your responsibility in whatever career, whether you're a, a MLB player or whether you're, you know, a bus driver? It doesn't matter. You need to make sure that you take your responsibility in your role and be passionate about it and do your best if they were doing their best which sometimes they do but it's about the consistency you want someone to do their best if you do your best and you fail that's okay by my book but if you're if it doesn't really look like you're putting in a hundred percent effort and more importantly a hundred percent caring then that's where it's a turnoff for me let me push back on this way i'm mary saying you can see the players and they're laughing again this could be data because the yankees may win the world series 
Okay. Stop. <laughs> Garland just laughed out loud. I I'm just shaking my head now. He's a hardcore Mets fan. <laughs> yeah, and sorry. That's why. Trust me, your team's not winning either. But that being said, Mary, isn't it also true that being loose, listen, we goof around. We have a 10 hour production day. There's goofing around and laughing and making fun of each other, mostly me. But we're deadly serious about the product and its quality. How the heck do you, and by the way, Elvin, come on camera, Elvin. How do we do, how do we balance being serious, looking serious, but also having fun? Because you're criticizing the Yankees for being in a dugout goofing around. You can, and, and I know Elvin's working on letting himself in, and it'll just take a second, but I think you have to show, and no, I don't want them to be in there moping and with a frown on their face because that's not good either. You want to have positive energy, but sometimes it, it shows uh, to your the people that are watching that there's just, they don't care. Elvin, I hear Mary, but I like the idea of we're serious, we're quality product. You hear me complaining all the time, why aren't we doing this, fat, blah, 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 blah. Excellence is the standard, not perfection. But how do you do that and still have a good time and stay loose? And that has a lot to do with leadership, by the way. It does. But the thing is that we know when to joke and we know when we have to be serious. So as soon as I tell you, Steve, it's time to go, we're in serious mode. We're getting the show done. When the tape stops rolling, it's time to have fun. Because if you don't have fun when you're working, then that's not the job for you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. By the way, you got yep. under a minute. <laughs> You know what? I love this. Elvin's that's got great. a way where he, when he says to you, that's what it is, it's not many people I'm intimidated by, but Elvin's one of them. Yeah, so stick that landing. 30 please. seconds now. Okay. okay, so Elvin, stay on camera as we end this. By the way, to Elvin and Scarlin and uh, Sylvester, Mary, who am I missing? Yeah, Amy, who's behind Amy, the Amy, who, who does cer closed circuit. Closed yeah. circuit. Close captioning. Close, closed captioning. Closed circuit. I just dated myself going back. All the way, 1978, I see the Jerry Cooney, Larry Holmes fight on closed circuit. Nobody was even born then, right? Closed circuit is not closed captioning. Not, not I, right. not, not at all. Sorry. Frank was born. You know, yeah, Frank was born. 10 seconds, Frank, Steve. Oh, Frank, I, by, by the way, I apologize, Frank. Talk about, see, Frank. Five seconds. Fun. Four, three, two. Frank, I was going to say great things <laughs> about you, but Elvin made me stop. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time. Thank you. It's Elvin. It's not me. <laughs> This edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Kessler Foundation, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ, and Commerce Magazine.